So I know it sounds like we got a ton of stuff going on, and we do, and I'm excited about it all because, uh, you know, the, the life of the church is an integral part of any community, and uh, we are really uh, have a great opportunity to, to step up and to promote some different events. Um, uh, as Zoe had said, next uh, Sunday, Brad Hertig will be here. If you don't know who Brad Hertig is, he's a motivational speaker. Uh, he's a young man, uh, just a typical high school uh, athlete, uh, his end of his sophomore year. He's from Ohio, uh, had a job in a factory, a uh, tragic accident, uh, cost him both of his hands. And uh, he went on to continue to play uh, his junior and senior year in, in uh, high school sports, uh, wound up leading the team in tackles uh, his senior year and made all-state honors. And uh, he just has a great uh, message of hope and of, of God working in and through his life in that incident to, to bring him to a point that uh, w- was able to restore him. And he, he's just, it's, it's a wonderful message. So if you can be here next week to catch that, uh, he'll be uh, here giving uh, uh, speaking on Sunday, and then Monday, uh, he and uh, the Ten Talents Band are joining for um, assemblies in the Fairview schools and the Mile schools. That'll be Monday. Just be in prayer over that uh, because it is a great outreach program uh, for young kids today. Just a, a, again, an inspirational message of hope. And uh, so, just be in, in prayer for that. That will be Monday, the 11th, um, that, that those uh, assemblies are taking place. Um, our missions uh, team, are, are they are sponsoring the women's event uh, in May, uh, May 7th, so you can get with them on that. And then they're also sponsoring a concert here May 27th. Uh, the band is Shiny Penny, uh, so you'll see some flyers like this uh, going up around here, around town, uh, other communities. Uh, tickets are on sale for those online or in person. Uh, you can get with me or any other member of the uh, missions team. Diane Bickford is here, and I will have a packet for you right after uh, service so that uh, you'll have those. And, um, again, we really want to promote these events and just kind of to, to get out uh, just a, a, any way that we can get the, the message of the gospel into the community and uh, just to strengthen the body of believers. And, and so we're just really kind of, of pushing these along. When you came in today, you may have received one of these. If you did not, it is just a uh, welcome home card. It is really just a contact card. Um, Talked about this last week, and it'll be pushing it for a couple of weeks yet. I just want to update our database to make sure that, that we have accurate contact information for everyone so that when events come up and we promote them out, uh, you, you'll be aware of them. Uh, so if, you, if you've worshipped with us for five minutes or for 50 years, it doesn't matter. Uh, we would really like you to fill this out and get it back to us so that we can be in contact with you about things that are going on, and we just have a, an accurate database. Cool. All right, all of that said, now uh, into today's message, Into the Wilderness is the, the title of today's message. And uh, I had about nine biblical examples of the reality of wilderness experiences, but I think that I'll probably pare those down as we, as we move along. So what am I talking about? Well, before church today, I was talking with one of our church members, and they're really planning on um, taking some extended time and traveling uh, next winter. Um, because this winter doesn't seem to want to end, so um, they're really looking at, and so we were talking about some of the, the different things, because you know, we, my family and I, we, we do a lot of bush camping, and we're into the wilderness all the time, but that's not what I'm talking about today, is, is wilderness experiences like that, but those times in your life where <laughs> you just find yourself up against it, when things aren't going like you had planned, or when, when things are just, just seem dark or hopeless, or, or that you're in a position where it just doesn't make sense. These are the wilderness experiences I want to talk about today, and so we'll start with the, one of the uh, first recording of suffering people there is, and that's Job. You're familiar with the, the phrase, having the patience of Job, and, and where that comes from, but Job's life is uh, kind of an amazing example for us because... Uh, Job kind of had everything going for him. And in chapter 1, verse 13, the wheels start to come off of his bus. And I'm just going to read this real quick for you here. I'm going to read it quick because the story really happens rapidly. Uh, There was a day when Job, his sons and his daughters, were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the ass feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yes, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, 
There came also another, and he said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I'm the only one who escaped to come and tell you. And while he was still talking, another speaker comes up and says that uh, the Chaldeans made out uh, three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yes, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I am the only one that has escaped and come to tell you. And while he was still talking, there came also another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and fell upon the young men, and they were all dead. And I am the only one who escaped to tell you. And just like that, Job was in the wilderness. Five minutes ago, he had everything going for him. Or two minutes, however long it took me to read that. That's the rapidity with which the information came to him. Just disaster after disaster, boom, boom, boom. And he's out in the middle of the wilderness. And he's got nothing. And through no fault of his own. In fact, uh, Scripture tells us that, that the Lord himself said of Job, he is upright and blameless. Oh, that we could each have that testimony spoken to us of God. That we were upright and blameless in all that we did. And this was Job. Praying daily, offering sacrifices daily for his family. Always into the presence of God. But he did nothing wrong and found himself in a wilderness experience. And later his friends would all come and counsel him and say, Well, there must be some secret sin that you have going on in your life. Why would God do this to you? With friends like Job's, who needs enemies, right? There's churches today that teach that, though. I had a friend who was going through a dark time in his life. His wife had been diagnosed with, with an ailment that was incurable. And they prayed over her, and they anointed her, and they kept praying over her. And she didn't get better, and she didn't get better. And the preacher was telling Steve, he said, you know, there's got to be something going on in your life. Or she'd be healed. God would heal her. And... Like Steve, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's real. I don't think that, you know, it doesn't matter where you're at in life. Sometimes you just get in the wilderness. It just happens. But check out Job's response to this. Continuing on the story. Right after all this, Job arose. He rent his mantle. He shaved his head. He fell upon the ground and worshiped. He's just lost everything. And his response wasn't shaking his fist. It wasn't screaming out. It wasn't a dark depression. His response was worshiping God. And he said that naked I came out of my mother's womb and naked I'll return. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. Bad things do happen to good people. And we find ourselves in wilderness experiences all the time. And sometimes we may wonder, and sometimes we may shake a fist. Sometimes we may like, Lord, how long? What is this all about? What's going on? And there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay to wonder where God's at working in your life because at least you're relying on him. At least you think there's somebody looking over you that you can cry out to. And what would life be like if we didn't have someone to reach out to? Job's not the only one to find himself in wilderness experiences. The Israelite story is, is very familiar. And in the book of Numbers chapter 14, it relates all that went on with them. And God had gotten to a point where the Israelites had just continually, time and time again, cried out, why did you bring us out here to the wilderness to die? There's no hope for us out here. We would have been better off in our slavery where we were. At least then we knew what the future was. And time after time after time, this was the lament. And God stepped in and rescued him time after time. And finally, he was like, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to wipe them out. And Moses interceded for him and said, Lord, these are your people. You can't. you got to remember your promise. And so the Lord said, okay, I do remember my promise. But none of these people are going to the promised land that I gave them. For 40 years, they're going to wander in the wilderness till they all die off, and their offspring will come in and receive the promise that I have given them because they have turned away from me again and again and again. Sometimes we find ourselves in wilderness places from forces outside of ourselves 
due to national or corporate sin. There are things that a corporate body of people commit over and over and over again that allow us to wind up in a position of wilderness. Again, they come out from outside of ourselves, but there's assignable blame. We can say, oh, I can see where that came from. We created that. We made that happen. We, we created an atmosphere of turning our back on God that allowed us to step out from underneath the shadow of the Almighty. The beauty in circumstances like that is when we repent and return, immediately we're back under the shadow of the Almighty. In fact, God promises us that if my people who are called my people will repent, turn away from their national, their corporate sin, I will heal their land. I will forgive them. I will restore them. Another Old Testament example of wilderness experiences is Joseph, the youngest of the 12 brothers of Israel. And he finds himself in a wilderness experience. I'll read this right out of uh, chapter 37, verse uh, 4 through 11. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers that they hated him even more, because he said, listen, I had this dream, and there we were, binding sheaves of grain in the field, and suddenly the, my sheaves stood up, and your sheaves all gathered around and bowed down to mine. And his brothers hated them even more. He said, but hey, I had another dream. <laughs> He's like, in this one, the stars all bowed down to me. And his brothers hated him more. You know, sometimes we find ourselves in wilderness experiences through our own arrogance, through our own code of conduct. Sometimes we bring things on ourselves out of pride. There's another one of Elijah, and I'll just make this one real quick, the story of Elijah. Uh, well, I guess we'll call this the, the Old Testament in seven minutes. We'll just get through it all, right? So Elijah, he's in the, at, at the height of his uh, tenure as a prophet, if you will. He's just experienced the miracle of miracles, and that's the, the, the battle between him and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And he has built the author, uh, altar. He has doused it with water. It's soaked. He's called down fire from God and burned it up. He's put to death all of the prophets of Baal. King Ahab's like, great job. Oh, yeah, okay, God is real. This is awesome. And Elijah's so excited at the end of this that, that as they're going back to the palace and Ahab's driving his chariot, Elijah outruns him, filled with the spirit and the excitement from when he's accomplished so much. And Ahab tells his wife Jezebel, and Jezebel says, tomorrow Elijah will be dead. And Elijah goes from this super high high to the pit of despair and runs off to the wilderness. And again finds himself in a wilderness experience. They're real. They happen to us. There are reasons beyond our, our control sometimes. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. Sometimes we're the, we're the one that brings it on ourselves. Many times we're not. But we have an example in the New Testament of a wilderness experience and how we can survive those and what we can learn from being in them. And this is the story of Christ wilderness experience retold in Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11 will be our focus today this is a scripture that typically is used at the beginning of a, a Lent season um, I chose to fold it in right here as we're wrapping up Lent and moving into our Palm Sunday and, and Easter week uh, celebrations in uh, but Matthew 4 1 through 11, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered and said, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, 
He will give his angels charge concerning you that they will support you with their hands so that you won't even stub your toe on a stone. Jesus said, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to them, I will give you all of these things if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus told him, go away, for it is written, you are to worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him, and immediately angels came and began to serve him. Wilderness experiences come, and they do. And I'm like, oh, gee, you said that a bunch of times, Pastor. Where's the message of hope in all this? I promise you, there is, okay? Because it is a reality, though, that we will face troubles in this life. Jesus told his disciples as he sent them out, he said, look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and harmless as doves, because people will hand you over to the rulers and flog you and to governors and kings, and they will persecute you because of me. I say this verse all the time. This is John 16, Jesus tells his disciples, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. This is why I told you everything Jesus said. Here's all of the stuff that I've led up to this moment. I've told you so that you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Where's the peace in that, right? He says, I told you everything so that you'll have peace. You will have suffering in this world. But be courageous. Be not overwhelmed. Be not dismayed. Because I have overcome the world. In other words, Jesus is telling them that no matter what is dished out to you with me, you can handle it. You can have victory in the moments of despair in your life if you would just trust me. Wilderness experiences come. Jesus was led out into the wilderness. Satan tempts him. And Jesus, at the end of that 40-day fast, has a response for him as it's going on. He stayed focused because he allowed himself to be led by the Spirit. He was able to maintain his focus because where he was, the Spirit had led him to be. And in that moment, he was spending time seeking God, trying to find out and connect with him through a 40-day fast. Where are you? What do you want me to do? I'm preparing for my ministry. How is this going to work? He was fasting. He was drawing near to God. Scripture tells us, if you draw near to God, I will draw near to you, he says. And so if you're seeking him and if you're working for him and if you're looking out for him and you're you're trying to get close to him, he's going to get close to you. And as he comes alongside of you in those moments, he's there to strengthen you. Jesus had a second weapon. Not only was he seeking to to be in the presence of God, though, he was in the word. The psalmist says, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. He knew what the book said. And he knew how to use it and interpret it and understand it correctly so that when Satan came along and said, hey, doesn't it say this? He was able to say no. I have sound doctrine. I understand what the Bible actually says. It's not some twisted and perverted message that you're bringing about, but it is pure, and it is true, and it is right, and I have it hidden in my heart. Wilderness experiences come along, one, for one reason that they come along is to teach us to focus. Focus on who's really in charge. Focus on what really matters. Focus on who God is and what he would have you learn or become in and through the moment that you're in. But they also teach us to live for something beyond ourselves. In verses 5 through 7, the devil tells them that, uh, you know, if you throw yourself down here, it's written that you'd be protected. And Jesus said, we're not supposed to test the Lord, dear God. We're not supposed to put out there like, oh, you said I could do this and then see. You you go step off the edge of the Grand Canyon, I don't care how much Jesus loves you, it's probably not going to work out very good for you. At least in the immediate moments after. 
Jesus tells us, don't take care for yourself. Don't worry about that. I got you. Focus on what God's purpose is for your life. Live for something outside of yourself. Don't worry about where you're at. I'll take care of that. If you stay focused on me, I can lead you to take care of others in their problems. And who knows, whatever trial you're going through right now, it might just be a strengthening moment somewhere 10, 15, 20 years down the road where somebody comes along, maybe one of your grandkids will be in, in the midst of something that you're dealing with right now, and you're going to say, I know exactly how to deal with it. Because when I was there, I trusted God. I leaned on him. I was strengthened in and through his word, and I was able to overcome it. And now I've got a message of hope for you in the midst of your despair. And the other thing wilderness uh, experiences exist for is to teach us to trade Worshipping things of the world for worshipping things of God. In fact, the devil took him up to a very high place and said, I will give you all of the world if you just worship me. And Jesus' response was that it, worship God and God alone. That's where my focus is. That's what I'm here for. I am here to worship not the things of this world. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have some shiny things in your life because that happens, and it's okay. But if that's your primary focus, if that's your sole focus, things can come off derailed real quick. But if you're willing to trade the things of this world for worshiping God, in fact, Jesus said, if you seek my kingdom and my righteousness first, all that stuff will be added. Just it's a matter of where the focus is. What am, I, what am I worshiping? What am I worshiping? The things of the world or the things of God? Am I staying focused on God once again and worshiping Him? It's, you know, the, the real question is have I traded pleasure for purpose? Instead of just running around seeking to have a good time, am I looking to accomplish something? Is there an end goal? What is, to what end are, am I doing the things that I'm doing? What, what is on the backside of that? Have I traded the lust of things in this world for love, for true love, for a real abiding love, a selfless, sacrificing love? I would encourage you that whatever your wilderness experience is today, that you would use it to draw near to God to focus on him. To find yourself in a place right now, and, and maybe you are there, that you just throw your hands up. Lord, I can't do this on my own. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I've gotten nowhere. I'm surrendering this issue to you. And then to take that moment and start living for something bigger than yourself. Something outside of yourself. Use that moment as an outreach to somebody else that you might be able to strengthen them or encourage them. And I would encourage you to take this wilderness experience and trade desiring more of the world for desiring more of God. Because I assure you the promise that says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you is real. And he wants nothing more than to be with you alongside whatever that wilderness you find yourself in right now. He wants to walk with you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to shelter you and shield you. And so as you move through this world and the different wildernesses that exist out there, rely on God to get you through those moments. Because in all of God's promises, in all of the... the the things that he has done in, in his creation. The culmination is what Christ did for us. Fully God and fully man on the cross. Giving up of himself for each one of us. That we might be able to draw near to God in a real and a powerful way. God has worked in and through his creation from the moment 
He spoke the first of light into existence. And he has reached out and called out down through the millennia for us to know who he is. And he sent his prophets to speak to us one after another and to draw the world into the knowledge that there's a God in heaven and that he cares for you. And when the fullness of time, Scripture tells us, he himself stepped out of his glory, became man, walked the earth in the form of Jesus, shared his wisdom and his compassion and his knowledge with his disciples and those who would gather around him, worked miracles of healing and of of imparting knowledge and understanding of the old laws, cared for each and every one of his people in a way that said, I understand where you are. I've been in the wilderness myself. I know what it feels like. And out of my love for you, I give all of myself that you might know me. And he chose to walk that road to the cross, to be put to death, to be buried, and to rise again, that we might be united with God in a real and positive communion. And on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. And we are called to remember all that God has done as we prepare to partake in communion. A symbolic representation of Christ himself living inside of each one of us. A reminder that no matter what wilderness we find ourselves in, he endured wilderness. He endured temptation. He endured sorrow. He knew what it was like to mourn someone. He knew what deep love for his his fellow believers were. And he calls us to know that in and through this sacrifice for each of us. Let us pray. Loving God, we do come before you again today. And as the table of your communion is set before us, we offer up ourselves, Lord, as living sacrifice to your great love. Strengthen us, Lord, in our time of wilderness. Strengthen us in each of our individual and corporate ministry, Lord, that we might become in and through these elements the love of Christ. Lord, we just pray that you pour out your spirit on each of us today. Make us be for the world your love, your grace, your mercy as you make these elements be for us a representation of your body and your blood. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. I've asked Darren Rhodes, uh, current head of